Good evening, everyone. This evening, we are very fortunate to be addressed by Professor Nilika Malabige, who, in fact, does not need any introduction, but I think it's my duty to formally introduce uh, Professor Malabige. Uh, Professor Nilika Malabige is the head of the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine at the University of Sri Jawadhanapura and an academic visitor at the MRC Human Immunology Unit at the University of Oxford. She is also a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. She was also recently appointed to the WHO Technical Advisory Group on COVID-19 Technology Access Pool. My dear friends, my dear students, I consider it my privilege to have uh, invited and to have Professor Malavige with us this evening. Uh, we all have seen and heard of the work that she has carried out during this very challenging time, how responsible she has been with all the work. On a personal note, I have known her for quite some time. The time I was lecturing at the Colombo Medical School, she was a student, not just a student, one of the most brilliant products of University of Colombo. I remember she topped her batch. She didn't stop there. She went on to do her MRCP PET and of course a PhD from University of Oxford. But those are all her professional achievements in, in addition to the various research activities that she has carried out. But above all, what I have admired in Prof. Nelika is the commitment, the simplicity, and believing in what she does and being a true Sri Lankan. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Nilika Malavige for accepting our invitation and I kindly uh, invite you to start your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen and my dear students, thank, thank you, so you, much. May, you may type in your questions while she makes her presentation and uh, make sure that we will be able to take a few questions at the end of her presentation. Uh, when you type in, please do indicate from which entity you are. If you are from a gateway school, say which school it is. If you are from Springfield, please mention that. Any other entity, please mention that as well, because we will have thousands of participants today, but we will try our very best to have a few questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for inviting me. This is indeed a, a pleasure and a privilege to talk about something very close to my heart because I, uh, I've got kids too and of course everybody has been affected by COVID uh, but I would la like to start by thanking Gateway everybody at Gateway because I'm sure all of you know that you donated a real-time PCR machine to our lab uh, it was one of the best if not the best that is out there and uh, not only are we using it for our PCRs uh, it is because it's a really special kind of machine uh, before we do our sequencing because right now uh, we are still the only sequencing facility in Sri Lanka unfortunately uh, we, we need to do certain things to our samples before we sequence them and uh, we, we can do it only using this particular uh, PCR machine so I think when you donated it uh, you didn't uh, know all that uh, the, the, the actual benefit uh, it, it would uh, be, be to us so thank you so much everybody uh, for donating uh, such a wonderful machine to us and helping us out in, in uh, doing all the work we are doing. So to start about COVID-19 in Sri Lanka uh, and schooling, I, I thought I'd first talk a bit about the current situation in Sri Lanka and then uh, the COVID situation in other countries and schooling, uh, basically uh, how schools went on or didn't go on uh, in other countries uh, uh, based on what they had. And there's a lot of talk about vaccination and, and kids. And I'm sure uh, we'll, uh, everybody would want to know about vaccination and kids. So I'm only going to talk about kids here 
and uh, because that's uh, what we are here for. Now this is, uh, okay, just let me get rid of this, okay. Uh, so this is a map uh, of, of the incidence, uh, incidence of COVID in different countries. So the more darker a country is, that means that country has more cases per million population. So as you can see, Sri Lanka is lo looking a little bit dark right now, uh, along with several other countries. Uh, I mean, UK, USA, all those countries are also looking quite dark uh, with uh, Europe um, and Iran uh, uh, and so on, because we are reporting around 100 to 500 cases uh, per million population right now. So this is as of 31st of August 2021. Uh, we know that we are under a lockdown and uh, uh, we've had, I think, two weeks of lockdown now or, or just a little bit longer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, now, uh, although within two weeks, we don't see any difference in the deaths and actually they have sort of increased from where we started the lockdown. Uh, uh, we have several call centers in Sri Lanka uh, by the Ministry of Health, the, uh, the Rajagiriya, you know, COVID control center, also a call center run by the SLMA and all these call centers are uh, I mean, they were just overflowing uh, a few days ago, but there seems to be a slight gradual reduction in the number of uh, COVID infected individuals, at least in the Western province. So uh, I know everybody's complaining about uh, the whether it's a true lockdown, but it is uh, appears to be having an effect. But when it comes to deaths, okay, let me, let me move on to the slide. Okay. So, so basically uh, moving to the number of deaths, uh, we look a little bit more darker than the rest of the countries because if you remember the uh, previous slide I showed you, uh, US and, and several other European countries were looking quite dark, but when it comes to deaths, uh, it doesn't seem too bad. Uh, but Sri Lanka is having like five to ten deaths per million of population. And uh, as we just discussed, we are, we was, we are seeing a high increase in death trends and it's hovering around 200 uh, plus or minus right now. Uh, so the deaths we are seeing today are a result of infection that happened two or three weeks ago. So uh, the any impact on any lockdown or any other movement restrictions, you know, uh, the, the impact to happen will take two to three weeks more. But definitely uh, we can see a trend in the number of cases going down during the past few days. Now, but what is worrying is, uh, this is again as 30th of August, they don't have more recent data than that. We do have a very high positivity rate. Uh, so we have a, about 20 to 30% or just over 30% of our PCRs are being positive. Now you can see a completely different trend in other countries which had a high case load. So they are doing a lot of testing to detect every case. Whereas our testing is a little bit less, we know that. And so because of that, we are getting a large proportion of positive individuals. Of course, we don't have the liberty to do the same number of tests as Australia and so many other countries. We do have, we know that the economic situation in Sri Lanka is not that great. Uh, so we can only do what we can do. And so this is just the test per thousand people. And uh, you can see that, uh, so this is between 0.5 to 1. And we are do on in the lower side when it comes to doing tests. Now coming to the variants, I think that is important because everybody is scared about Delta and uh, but Delta is what everybody has. Okay. So because Delta is seen in 170 countries, it is not only not seen in a few countries and these African countries don't have a lot of sequencing facilities uh, and because of that we actually don't know uh, the, the, va the variant that is dominating or what, what, what these countries have. But basically, I, I believe if sequencing was carried out in these African countries, we would see uh, that it is Delta. But basically, Delta is the dominant variant everywhere. And that is because currently of all the variants, I know you are confused with different variants being announced every day, Epsilon, Mu, and uh, soon we'll be finished with all the Greek alphabet. But uh, as of now, the, the most dominant variant is Delta, and that is because it is uh, much more transmissible than any other variant so far. So if something has to overcome or become dominant than Delta, it has to be more transmissible and uh, we don't see it happening as of yet. We don't know about the future, of course. And 
not only is Delta dominant, the it is the dominant variant in uh, so many countries. So this is South Africa, US, Singapore, UK. I mean, I've listed out so many countries and Delta is this and uh, these are the different types of other variants. We do have a little bit of alpha left in our country uh, as of the last time. So this is uh, world data, but basically all countries are seeing Delta and when Delta comes, that's all you're going to get. Now, just to summarize the Sri Lankan situation, we do have a high death rate per million individuals. We do see high case fatality rates, uh, maybe because of uh, we are not reporting all the cases, so because case fatality rates are number of deaths over number of cases, but because of in, uh, less testing, we don't possibly catch all the positive individuals, so our case fatality rates do go up. And of course, our hospitals are overwhelmed uh, and we have those issues as well. And so, so those could also contribute and we do have high positive rates with minimum testing. But by the looks of it, I mean, I, I wasn't saying this a few days ago, but by the looks of it, uh, we, we are either becoming st stabilizing and we are just about to see, uh, you know, a, a decrease. So, so and because the restrictions have been extended for 10 more days, let's see what we will see. Now, I think the most important questions that one wants to know regarding this pandemic is how to move forward. And if we question, I'll, I'll show this slide later, if we question why we are actually worried about COVID when it initially emerged from China, if somebody said that there was a virus causing common cold and a little bit of fever emerging in China, nobody would care. I mean, it won't make news at all. But we only are worried about COVID because it kills. It causes severe pneumonia, making people end up in the ICU, needing ventilation, and of course it kills. So if the only reason we are worried about COVID is because it kills. Now, so the important thing is who does it kill? And it depends on age. So if we take the reference population as 18 to 29 year olds, okay? So the 18 to 29 year olds are the comparison population. If you take individuals between the ages of 65 to 74, they have a 90 times higher risk than this comparison group of dying when they get COVID. But individuals between the ages of 75 to 84 have a 220 times higher risk of dying than this comparison group. Okay, But if you go down, uh, individuals' children between the ages of 5 to 17 have a 16 times lower risk of dying than the comparison group and uh, uh, children between the age to zero to four years have an even less risk of dying than the comparison group. Okay, so that is uh, some important thing that I wanted to highlight. And then well, who, who of, of the older people, because we have established that it is older people dying, and this is why in all countries in the world, it was the over 60 age group that was targeted at first, uh, and later uh, the, the, the other age groups. Just, just, just one second. Uh, uh, that was why the older individuals were targeted first. And as you can see, it is the older individuals who also died in Sri Lanka. And of the older individuals, it was especially those who had comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease. And unfortunately, in all countries, men were more likely to die than women. I mean, the, that, that it was a slight increase in men. Now, again, if I put uh, the age in terms of uh, the way that people can understand. This is the risk percentage of individuals who can die when they get infected rather than just the risk. So if somebody gets COVID over 75 percent, uh, sorry, oh, oh, those over 75 years, 12 percent of them are likely to die. It falls to 2.2 percent from 65 to 74. When it comes down to, you know, school age or, you know, 5 to 14 years is 0.001.3%. So if we take that in a other perspective, if 1 million children get infected, 13 could die. That's a lot. Out of 1 million dying is a lot. But if 1 million 65 to 74 year olds get infected, 22,000 could die. And if 1 million more than 75 year olds get infected, 120,000 could die. So this is just uh, uh, showing the risk of death and uh, I, and this is really important because this is why uh, when, when the vaccines were manufactured also, uh, they were not tri trialed in children because I mean, people were, didn't actually worry about children. They were not the 
group that anybody was worrying about. It was the all the individuals that people were worrying, uh, worrying about. As you can see, when you look at the statistics, uh, th th everybody had very good reasons to worry about the old individuals and not the young individuals. Now, if you look at the US data, because we know that so many people died in US and they had a ridiculous number of cases. Um, so in, in US, as of uh, 26th of August 2021, uh, 4 million something children got uh, infected, uh, which represented 14.8% of all cases. And uh, of these 4 million uh, plus cases in children, uh, 1.6 to 3.6% of them were hospitalized. And, uh, and some, uh, it differs from various hospitals and the mortality was zero in some states and 0 0.24 uh, of those who were hospitalized. So this is just the hospital uh, infection rates, the hospitalization rates and mortality in uh, US where they had over 4 million, close to 5 million children being infected. And of course, over and over again, studies have shown, this is from UK, that uh, deaths uh, from COVID are rare in children. So this is a, a paper from Nature, uh, which is a top international journal of, on the 29th of July, 2021, uh, showing that deaths from COVID are incredibly rare among children. And, uh, but there are certain children who are at risk of getting, uh, dying from COVID. And the risk factors in children are the same as in adults. It is obesity, diabetes, and so on. So th there was a large study carried out in, uh, in the UK about children in hospitalizations and COVID. And uh, of, of until February 2021, so if you go back uh, what, to what happened in UK, UK had the biggest wave in the second wave, which lasted last from November to February. From November to February, the death rates per million population was the highest in the world. I know everybody is talking about that Sri Lanka currently has the highest death rates per world. We have uh, about nine, nine to nine point five individuals dying per million population in Sri Lanka right now. During the second wave in UK, which was from November to February, 18 per, uh, million people died in UK. So twice as many, the deaths were so high, the highest so, uh, so far in the world. And when you, and up to February 2021, uh, 5,800 children were admitted to hospitals, uh, to, to hospitals in the UK, compared to 367,600 children admitted for other emergencies, which excluded injuries and uh, 250 required intensive care okay and there were 690 children which is uh, who were admitted with this rare inflammatory condition called multi-system inflama inflammatory syndrome uh, and the, although the risk was small the children who were obese and with heart disease the children the same risk factors as, as adults children who are obese who had heart disease who had hypertension who had kidney disease who had cancers uh, so on were the in, uh, children who were at risk of developing severe COVID. And so this is the same uh, uh, statistics uh, that is given. So children have a, a two in a million chance of death from COVID-19. So this is data coming from the UK. And the risk factors for severe disease in children is obesity, diabetes, uh, immunocompromised. So children get immunocompromised for so many reasons. Uh, in one important thing is uh, kidney disease. We know that certain children have uh, childhood nephrotic syndrome, which a lot of steroids are given. Uh, then certain children have cancers uh, and cancers cause a lot of immunosuppression. So uh, children with kidney disease, cancers and, and uh, illnesses like that are immunocompromised. And sometimes you are immunocompromised from birth. Then children with uh, certain neurological disorders. So this is not epilepsy. So when we say neurological disorders, this, are, this is not epilepsy, but things like cerebral palsy. I don't know if you know what that is. So um, because of certain birth defects, uh, they have uh, sometimes bedridden and uh, have, have difficulty in movement and so on. And babies less than zero to um, babies between the ages of zero to three months. And they were also at high risk. So uh, at the very extremes of uh, very extreme of age, like newborns are at risk. 
and of course and in individuals over 20 years are adults but they were also put into the children's group um, certain individuals going to school at that time also put into the uh, children's group and analyzed now given all that we know that how uh, schools have been closed uh, in sri lanka for a long time and i know in schools like gateway and many other international schools uh, online education has been conducted very successfully so I, I don't think the education has been affected that much at all in international schools uh, of course the situation in government schools is very very different uh, we know that a large proportion of sri lankan children are not going to international schools but to government schools and even the very top government schools have not had the opportunity to conduct the same type of online uh, programs for school children and we know that uh, e even when schools did do some sort of online program children were climbing on trees getting on rooftops because there was no signal and also if you had two or three children and if you had just one device uh, there were families even, even the very well to do families had a issue with how do you give out so many laptops or, or other uh, tabs or mobile devices for children to get into uh, education but the education is just one aspect of school i don't know at least the old individuals who are li listening in uh, individuals my age uh, basically i don't think any of us went to school to learn i can i can definitely uh, say that no, nobody went to school to learn i mean we had textbooks we read them and all that but we went to school for so many other reasons and uh, which, which i believe are the most important reasons and these most important reasons for going to school is taken away from children right now uh, so and, and these have long term devastating effects now when we can't i'm going to show you about 6 7 slides uh, about school school closure so all this information is available at the united nations website on education so last year may 2020 Uh, we, this was a new virus nobody knew about what was going on and and uh, nobody knew how to deal with the virus so everybody was closing and and the whole world went into lockdown including school closure so these dark uh, dark blue areas are the countries which have school closure so in may 2020 157 countries had country wide school closures okay but uh, some countries had had partially open like in india i mean india it was fully open but some countries like russia uh, Ch china and, and uh, you know european countries had partial partially open so this was the situation may 2020 two months and, and this is of course sri lanka we are also closed you know you know them now in july 2020 uh, because countries really rapidly learn uh, countries open schools So Europe was having a massive wave in July 2020. We know that if you just remember and go back and look at the statistics, uh, Latin America was having a much worse wave, so they were closed. US and Europe were having a massive wave, but they opened up schools, saying that uh, European and US children can't, don't have access to online schooling that much, so they opened up. So in 42 countries, there were country-wide closures, including Sri Lanka. India was going through a situation; they also closed. In November 2020, okay. so uh, us partially closed because they were having a huge i mean about 3000 something people were dying every day per, and uh, november in uk if you remember that was the really bad time you know when when so many people were dying uk and rest of europe and except for a few countries are, uh, are open sri lanka is still closed okay uh, we did have open for like a month or, or three weeks in in september or some somewhere like that just a month and so this is november 2021 in the world only 27 countries have country wide school closures in march okay in march we do have a partial school closure uh, we do open up some uh, schools for a levels o levels and so on but uh, most of the rest of the world are open with us also having partial school openings a uh, closure may 2021 we are closed 23 countries have country wide closures okay and we are one of them june 2021 21 countries only have country wide closures we are one of them the rest are open okay and of course this is september uh, 2021 only 15 countries have country wide uh, closures and we are one of them okay so uh, when if you can go to the web uh, that website and go through every month starting from the pandemic up to now 
And one thing important thing you will realize, no country in the world has cool closures like Sri Lanka did. And we know that we are having a tough time right now in Sri Lanka because when you looked at the statistics, yes, uh, things, were, things are not looking so good, but they are improving, of course. But no other, all other countries, I mean, most of the countries in the world were so much more affected than COVID than Sri Lanka. They had their schools open. Uh, in Sri Lanka, for some reason, education has not been a priority or more. I see it in a different way. I think uh, as, as parents are very uh, worried about our kids getting COVID, when actually when you look at the statistics that I just showed you, we have to be worried about our parents and not our, our children. It's our parents we have to look about, look after in situations like COVID and, and of course kids are important. I mean, of course I, I've got kids, uh, I, I, but you have to take everything in a context. Now, do you vaccinate and send kids to school? So this is as of 31st of August. Uh, okay, the rich countries have vaccinated a huge population uh, in their countries. Uh, but most of the countries have achieved less than 50%. Uh, Sri Lanka is, of course, doing well. Uh, and we know when I just showed you the previous chart, a large number of countries, uh, only 15 countries have cl fully closed their schools. And, uh, uh, and this is without, of course, immunizing kids. Only a very few countries immun immunize kids right now. And, uh, and this is the number of confirmed cases per million population as of 2nd of September. US is having a lot of cases. Europe is having, or Europe and Scandinavian and all these countries are having a lot of cases. Russia is having a lot of cases. A familiar population, all these countries are having a lot of cases, um, uh, but they're open. Okay, so that is another important point I wanted to make. Now, there are so many different vaccines. Uh, all of you know about the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer Moderna, the viral vector vaccines like uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Sputnik, Johnson Johnson. Then we have the whole virus vaccines, inactivated vaccines. And so there are different vaccines which are being used in Sri Lanka and rest of the world. But you can't, uh, now the countries which are vaccinating children, not all of these vaccines are approved in children. Okay, and of course, now in Sri Lanka, we do have some individuals who are fully vaccinated to also die. So we have to understand what vaccines do. And this again is an important uh, concept to understand. Now, if we take an eight-year-old, I just told you uh, the the uh, how how the risk of dying. So, when say, when an eight-year-old is fully vaccinated, the risk of dying dying of course reduces. The risk of dying reduces to an unvaccinated fifty-year-old. Okay, so a fully vaccinated eight-year-old has the same risk of dying as an unvaccinated 50 year old. A fully vaccinated 50 year old has the same risk of dying as an unvaccinated 30 year old. Okay, so, so all these things are very age dependent. And now coming to children and vaccines, there have only been two vaccines which have undergone trials in children. And because of that, only two vaccines have been approved in children. So when we say children, we are talking about children over 12 years. Uh, children under 12 years are also children. But no vaccines have been tried in children less than 12 years so far. So vaccinating children, children less than 12 years is out of the question because I mean there are no vaccines. And the reason we haven't been, nobody has been looking at the less than 12 years is because uh, I mean because they were they were not having much issues. So when you look at this, this is Pfizer by the way. Uh, the scientific name of Pfizer is given here. Uh, so this was not a very large trial. Thousand in the uh, Pfizer group and 978 in the placebo group. So there were 16 infections in the placebo group and none in the Pfizer group. So the vaccine efficacy gives to like 100% vaccine efficacy, but even the placebo group, people, a lot of them didn't get uh, uh, infection. Uh, and this is the Moderna. So fully vaccinated at 14 weeks after the second dose, four people in the placebo got infection, whereas none in the uh, Moderna vaccine got it. So not much of a difference, but you get 100% efficacy. Uh, but this is symptomatic infection, mind you. Okay, so when you say efficacy again, symptomatic infection. When you look at asymptomatic infection, so this is asymptomatic infection 14 days after the second dose, uh, 16 people in the placebo and 21 people in the uh, Moderna arm did get uh, infection. So in children also, these vaccines don't prevent infection. 
okay so so we, we know right now a lot of healthcare workers are getting infected yes some of them are showing symptoms not that great symptoms most of them are asymptomatic and a lot of people who are vaccinated do get asymptomatic infection uh, so these vaccines don't seem to be preventing asymptomatic infection so if, so it looks like although you can give these vaccines to your kid it doesn't necessarily prevent infection itself but it will of course um, prevent a uh, symptomatic infection or your child developing symptomatic disease but i think the most important thing is not about whether the child develops symptomatic disease or not because everybody is worried about their ch children developing pneumonia and and uh, we've heard a few horror stories in sri lanka uh, about children dying so so far uh, 32 children have died in sri lanka so i got the statistics from the uh, health ministry itself today before giving this uh, presentation so so far 32 children have died and that is a large amount of children uh, now covid vaccines and children so many european countries have started vaccinating so these are the uh, so most countries haven't started even the second dose yet because uh, they've just started so these are the countries which have uh, vaccinated the percentage of uh, 12 to 18 year olds that have been vaccinated so quite a large proportion of 12 to 18 year olds have been vaccinated in these countries uh, not all european countries not all european countries are vaccinating children mind you and this is uh, us so us has recommended the pfizer vaccine and the modern as well to uh, children between the age of 12 to 15 years or 12 to 18 years and uh, so the cdc says that covid vaccines are safe and effective and uh, the children will need a second shot also and so on and of course uh, about this rare side effect that might happen in children which i will explain now the uk hasn't started uh, vaccinating their kids okay not not healthy kids uh, so the healthy 16 plus uh, 16 to 17 year olds in the uk are offered a single dose uh, of, of pfizer uh, uk is still thinking uh, whether a second dose needs to be administered to healthy 16 to 17 year olds so this is the uk position and but the uk says is uh, individual children between 12 to 15 year olds who are at increased COVID are, should be vaccinated. Those are children with neurological disabilities, with immunosuppression that I just described what it was, Down syndrome, uh, with learning disabilities uh, and, and you know neurological disabilities and so on. And of course, 12 to 17 year olds they are, who, who are living with a severe immunosuppressed individual in their house. So if, if the parents have some transplant, you know, renal transplant or something or, or cancer, then such children will be given it because they can, uh, because vaccinated children are less likely to get infected and then transmit it home. So this is to protect the uh, parents or, or either other individuals at home. So this is the UK's position that they are offering one dose only to 16 to 17, 17 year olds. So UK is having a, a sort of a cautious approach. And, uh, and that is because some countries are still looking at this rare side effect that happens with Pfizer and Moderna. It is only Pfizer and Moderna that is approved. So which is myocarditis or in other words, inflammation uh, or inflammation of the heart. Okay, so, and when, uh, so this rare side effect is mainly seen in males and not so much in females. So between the age group of 12 to 17, uh, in young males after the second dose around 67 uh, when, when you give a million doses about 67 children can develop this inflammation of the heart and so when you uh, so this is the latest uh, uh, advisory committee uh, recommendations in the US so the when you give a vaccine uh, to somebody you have to do the risk benefit so when you give a vaccine what are the risks of the vaccine and what are the benefits of the vaccine? So if you take our age group, I mean, there is no question of giving a vaccine. The risks of death are far outweigh the, any other risk. So when you, I'm just showing you males. Okay, I, I didn't put the females here. Uh, the, the risk, so when you vaccinate uh, the 12 to 17 year old males, you are preventing 5,700. So when you vaccinate a million uh, kids of 12 to 17, you are preventing 5,700 infections. 215 hospitalizations, 71 ICU admissions, and two deaths. So when you uh, vaccinate a million kids, you prevent two deaths. 
uh, which was discussed earlier. Uh, and the expected incidence of myocarditis is 56 to 69. So, so when you vaccinate a million kids, uh, 56 to 69 um, uh, boys will develop uh, between the ages of this much will are likely to develop myocarditis. Myocarditis is, is not bad, um, bad in the sense, I mean, it is inflammation of the heart. I mean, children do recover. Uh, in, they, they, they develop ch chest pain, difficulty in breathing and, and so on. That's how they present. So this is why I believe UK is uh, taking a, a more cautious approach. And it, because it's seen, especially with the second dose, this is why they have given one dose and waiting and to, to see how it unfolds. But of course, many other countries in Europe and US are giving uh, Pfizer and Moderna because uh, the risks uh, outweighs the benefits uh, and of course it reduces transmission and increases reduces the risks in adults. So moving forward with COVID. So this is uh, my last slide because I think it's important to take questions. Uh, I think it is obvious for you to you that Sri Lanka had its schools closed more than any country in the world since the beginning of the pandemic despite lower case rates and deaths. Okay, I mean, we, until now we didn't have uh, uh, that much cases and deaths. And right now, uh, only 15 countries in the world have their schools closed. And of course, we have a high number of cases and a similar number of cases are seen in, in Europe, in Russia, in US and so many other countries. Uh, the, if you take the cases, of course, we have higher death rates because our, our, all our adult population are not fully vaccinated yet. Uh, the UK, Europe and other countries are seeing very few death rates because uh, vaccines prevent deaths and because you have a fully vaccinated pe in, uh, population being infected, so, so then it's okay. So, uh, and in other countries, uh, you can see that vaccination only started recently and all other schools, uh, and they had lots of cases all this time and all other sco uh, schools were open way before children were vaccinated. But of course, children with immunosuppression, obesity, heart disease, kidney disease can get severe uh, disease and at, are at a risk of dying. And in Sri Lanka, 32 kids have died so far. Uh, and uh, vaccines are safe with very rare side effects, which I spoke about uh, the myocarditis issue. And of course, UNESCO has made a statement saying that this is the uh, UNICEF uh, director saying reopening schools cannot wait. Uh, and Europe opened their schools and uh, very early. Uh, I mean, they hardly cl closed their schools because uh, they said that European children didn't have equal access to online schooling and online schooling was not a, a good method of teaching children. So I would like to end here and thank Gateway School again for the donations that you gave us. We really appreciate all that. So thank you so much.